you want to take out your Bible and open up to the, the book of Job, Job chapter 40. We've taken our time this week, and uh, on Sunday morning we started to realize that if we're going to be people who claim to have fellowship with God, to share something in common with God, then we're going to have to start striving to love people like He does and to treat people like He does and even see them the way that God sees them. Then Sunday night we took a little bit of time and we talked about clothing ourselves with humility and realize that we have to see each other as more important than ourselves and we have to be more concerned about each other than we are about ourselves. Last night we talked about that love for one another and saw that we have to accept one another and not judge one another and to not be people who make up our own standards along the way and try and feel like we have to impose those on everybody else. We'll let the Bible make up the standard and we'll just hold to it. Tonight I want to take perhaps another step forward. Tomorrow night we'll be dealing with be kind to one another and be at peace with one another. But tonight I want to take some time and look at the idea of do not complain against one another or do not speak against one another. You can probably think it almost feels like an American right to get to complain. I mean, it's hard to pick up a newspaper, watch a TV broadcast of news without somebody complaining about something. You can kind of imagine whenever you go and eat out perhaps at a restaurant, they even put comment cards out. At times I wonder why they even try. I mean, it's hard to please all the people all the time, right? You kind of start to notice there's kind of a, a common idea. Sometimes we use other words for the idea of complaining. Sometimes we say, well, they're nagging. We say maybe they're finding fault. Maybe they're even just a, a critic or criticizing things. Um, you kind of start to notice people, even some Old Testament words, to, to grumble or to, to murmur against one another. You kind of start to notice and to think back, what is really the purpose of complaining? What's the whole goal in complaining? Whenever we complain, it's usually because we want to change somebody's behavior. How many of you have ever been moved greatly by somebody complaining about you? How many of you get a real good response whenever people really just start to gripe about you? Ever work very well? Usually when people start to complain against us, usually it makes it even more difficult to clothe ourselves with humility. And here they are, and they're making the statements. Usually, also, and everything about whenever we're complaining, usually the person that we're complaining about isn't even there. And you go, well, what's the point? And then you really start to get into evil because really now we're just slandering one another. We're just speaking evil of one another, and it, there, where's the love in that? I want to kind of take some time tonight. We're going to look at, at several stories, look at some passages in the New Testament specifically. But I want you to kind of note some things, and I want you to see how God really views, spiritually views people who are complainers. In the Old Testament, we won't take time to look at this story. If you want to look at it on your own, you're more than free to. In Numbers 21, there's a story about the children of Israel. And here they are, they're out in the wilderness, they're out around Mount Hor, H-O-R, and they're close to the Red Sea. They get out there, they've already been given manna to eat, and it says that they just completely, they said, we don't have any food or any water. And then, ironically, they say, and we loathe, we hate this food that we have. Well, <laughs> it's hard to say that you don't have any food when you hate what you got. Now, here they were. That was their cry. We, we, we hate this stuff. We're tired of it. We don't have any food. We don't have any water. Ha ha. But then you kind of notice God gives them a response. He sends fiery serpents. And they bite quite a few. And they kill a whole bunch. And the people start to realize what they've done. They proclaim, we've sinned. We, we sinned. And Moses comes before God, and God says, I want you to take bronze. I want you to make a bronze serpent. I want you to put it up on a standard. In other words, kind of on, a, on a, what we would call a stick. It, he says, set it up there, and any time somebody gets bit with one of these, by one of these fiery serpents, tell them to look at the bronze serpent. And when they do, 
they'll be healed. I want you to kind of realize what God was trying to do. He says, you know, you need to put your focus on something different. Because usually whenever we complain, who's the focal point? It's usually us, isn't it? We wonder, how come I'm not getting something better? How come I'm having to work harder? How come I'm having to do this? How come they don't ever... You see how self-centered complaining is? I mean, do the children of Israel really consider that God had just led them out there to die? That's even what they said. What would be the purpose of that? It's like they just really didn't trust God to take care of things. You start to kind of look through these ideas to see... These people were complainers, and God said, I'll kill you for it. I mean, you really start to see the idea of God is not, well, you know, just, just try harder not to complain. How would it make you feel if the people that you were living with, people that lived in your own tent, that you had heard complain about, oh, we hate this food, it's terrible, and the next night to go out and have to bury their bodies? You think it would change your attitude about complaining against one another and complaining against God? I think that'd have a major impact on us. When we, when we lose people that are close to us, it has an impact on us. What if we knew the reason why they died? And it wasn't natural causes. Maybe that would change your attitude a little bit. I want you to kind of notice this passage here in Job 40. God has already done some talking through the previous couple of chapters. There's already been some conversations between Job and Eliphaz and Bildad and, and Zophar. Aren't those wonderful names? And here they are. They've kind of gone through all these conversations. Elihu comes in and talks, the young, the young man. And finally, the whole time through the book, Job asks, if I could just talk to God, he would understand. He gets what he asked for. I want you to see what God has to say to Job. Now, Job's not just an evil guy. Don't, don't think of it this way. But I want you to see. He's gone through some difficult things. He has never cursed God. But look at chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. How good are we at being fault finders? How good are we whenever we see each other to go, boy, you know, you really need to work on, his, on this in particular thing. We can think of the story that, that Jesus uses. He says, you know what, if you've got a log in your eye, how are you going to help pick the speck out of somebody else's? For some reason, we feel like we just need to tell everybody, boy, you know, <laughs> you're just a mess. God says, is the fault finder going to continue?